Welcome to episode 4 of Project Stressa, a timeline which starts with the point of divergence of Austria being admitted into Germany in 1919. It's 20 years later, and the Saxon allies of Germany, Britain, and Yugoslavia were at war with the Latin axis of France and Italy. The French and Italians have managed to secure favorable strategic positions thanks to the German demilitarized zones. Due to the Soviet's invasion of Poland, the introduction of Hungary into the Latin Axis, and fears of being partitioned by their hostile neighbors, the fascist parliament of Romania was deposed in favor of a pro-Saxon allied democratic one. Romania's introduction to the Saxon allies would bring Czechoslovakia and Poland into the alliance, strengthening their numbers. However, the introduction of these Central European allies would bring the Saxon allies into war with the Soviet Union, improving the relationship between the communists and fascists in their war against liberalism. How would the war develop from here? Let's continue to explore this timeline. As the Germans were being invaded on all sides, the British had their colonial empire at risk of destruction by the Latin Axis. Instead of the French Navy being on either the side of the British, or forcibly neutralized. In this timeline, the French Navy is fighting the British Navy directly. This alone spells immense trouble for the British, as the home islands would be under constant threat of naval invasion from their enemies, just a pond away. This, on top of the risk of having the supply chain of Gibraltar, Malta, and Egypt being cut off by a Spanish invasion, meant that any naval warfare that the British would engage in would be defensive in nature. The Latin Axis were completely aware of their advantage. They would attempt to quickly overwhelm the Middle Eastern forces of the Saxon allies in order to establish a supply line to the isolated colony of Italian East Africa. Their hope was that if they managed to humiliate the British quickly enough, they would be able to enter the negotiating table with the threat of a unified Latin Axis invasion into the Crown Colony of India. On top of the threat to the British and their African colonies, they also faced a threat to their Asian colonies due to the ascendant power of Japan and their pan-Asian expansionist policy. The Japanese, in the same way as our timeline, invades Manchuria, leaves the League of Nations, and invades China soon afterward. The British support China through the Burma Road, fearing Japanese ambitions on their Pacific colonies. However, the war stalled in China. The Japanese were seeking to open a separate front, where they would be able to divide the Chinese armies and eventually complete their subjugation. The French in the Indo-Chinese colony were in a perfect position to station more troops, threatening southern China and its precious resources. The various British armies in the region had already staged their invasion of French Indochina in order to secure their position in Asia. So, the Japanese would invade Indochina as well. As British and Japanese troops scrambled to secure Indochina for themselves, the potential for a Japanese-British collaboration had emerged. While the Saxon allies had been adamant in their support with the Chinese in the Sino-Japanese War, the stress that the British were under to defend their colonies with their navy stretched utterly thin was leading to a crisis where the British would need to have their naval forces deployed in too many places at once. And as the Soviet Union and the British were at war, the British feared that the Soviets would attempt to lead a series of invasions into their crown colony of India. The Japanese, too, were fearful of the Soviet Union, as the Soviets were yet another major supporter of the Kuomintang, and were showing signs of collaboration with the Latin Axis as well. An unthinkable proposal was conceived, where the British would stop the support of the Kuomintang, recognize the Japanese power government in Manchuria, and reinvite Japan into the League of Nations. If this proposal was to be accepted, the Japanese would have a blank check to subjugate Asia, besides the British and their allies' colonies, of course. Japan would stall negotiations to continue their occupation of northern Vietnam, opening a southern front with Chiang's Kuomintang, who seemed to be losing allies day by day. The French political scenario was mixed at home following the initial successes of the French in their war. The ascendant neo-socialists were continued to become more and more prominent, and thanks to the Soviet Union's introduction into the Second World War on the Latin Axis side, many far-right members of France were beginning to accuse the neo-socialists of conspiracy. Before the rise of the Fourth French Republic under Bretagne and the right-wing League's curview, Marcel Dehat and his core neo-socialists were members of the right wing of the Comintern. Marcel had abandoned international socialism for national socialism. Despite his early shift towards nationalism, many far-right traditionalists of the Action Francaise clique 
were mystifying Marcel's meteoric rise in their state, claiming that he was not a true nationalist. While the Leagues of the Cross of Fire, Francis Movement, and Action Francais would bind together in an alliance of reactionism, the PPF under Jacques Doriot would join forces with Marcel's neo-socialists. This is because Jacques Doriot was formerly a communist as well. The squabbling leagues were now in complete deadlock, accusing each other of undermining the war effort and treason against France. The political instability would favor the Saxon allies significantly, as foreign spies began supporting the French resistance, operating ever since the Batain coup in 1935. However, the Saxon allies would soon find that their once united resistance movement was shattered. The communist policy of resisting fascism was halted in favor of a united front against liberalism. This caused a significant turmoil within the resistance. The previously united socialists were now split between socialist ideals and Stalinist loyalists fighting amongst themselves as the liberals tried to claim leadership in the resistance in favor of the Saxon allies. While this obviously strengthened the control that the leagues had imposed upon the state, it was also fueling the fire of the reactionary leagues immensely, as the communists that remained loyal to Stalin were now supporting the neo-socialists indirectly. Growing more and more concerned with the political environment of France, the reactionary leagues would begin secret talk with Mussolini due to their shared concerns of the neo-socialists becoming more and more closer to Moscow. Mussolini and the reactionary leagues would begin creating contingency plans in the event of France falling into communism. While these talks would not amount to any action, it laid the foundation for a potential coup following Marcel's ascension to leadership within France. As the British desperately fought off the Latin Axis' invasion of the Middle East, the Eastern Front was extremely contentious. The Soviet army was not prepared for the sudden inclusion of the entirety of the German, Czechoslovakian, and Romanian forces backing the Polish. While each of these countries had their own internal issues which prevented their armies from operating at full capacity, the geopolitical advantage had quickly shifted to the Saxon Allies' favor. Supply lines that were initially scattered were soon replenished by the extensive railway networks that connected the eastern states to Germany and beyond. For example, while the Hungarian introduction to the Latin Axis had guaranteed encirclement of Vienna, the beleaguered Germans were suddenly capable of evacuating into friendly Czechoslovakia. Ironically, the Germans were now shielded by the fortifications that the Czechs had made to deter them. The Saxon allies had devised a defensive plan which preserved as many defensive positions as possible while considering their forces' capabilities. The conclusion was to, unfortunately, abandon southern Germany altogether, rely on Czechoslovakia and Germany's natural defenses in order to allow their forces to properly organize before staging a large counterattack. Naturally, this meant that the Saxon allies were afraid of overextending into the USSR. This gave the Soviets time to scramble their defenses together. After the Romanian king's decision to align Romania with the Saxon allies, the fascists who were formerly in power had gone insurrectionary, seeking to establish a fascist Romanian republic aligned with the Latin Axis. It was only a matter of time before Romania capitulated. Preparations for the government of exile were underway, as the Romanians were not anticipating their survival against the Latin Axis' onslaught. Due to the unwillingness of the British to commit too much of their navy to the Mediterranean, the Latin Axis were able to advance further and faster than the Axis of our timeline. El Alamein soon fell, and the Franco-Italian forces were marching into the Nile Delta. On top of this, the Syrian National Republic was making gains against Britain and their Iraqi mandate in the Levant, with their forces rapidly approaching Jerusalem. It was then that the Saxon allies had achieved yet another windfall to their war effort, by having Turkey join the war on the Saxon Allies' side. In our timeline, Turkey remained neutral in the Second World War, despite the Axis and Allies providing significant pressure and extensive promises to the young nation. However, in this timeline, they joined the Allies. This is due to several reasons. The most important to note is the Syrian National Republic's claims on their land. Syria wished to round out the Greater Syria by gaining a strategic mountain border at the expense of Turkey. This is a considerable threat to Turkey, especially as they were already boarding the Latin Axis in Bulgaria and the Italian-controlled island of Rhodes. With promises of territorial gains among their former imperial borders, the Turkish joined the Saxon allies. This would then cascade in the Sadaban Pact triggering, as now two of the four signatories of Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan were at war with the Latin Axis. 
These formerly neutral nations had now had their forces turned against the Latin Axis and the Soviet Union, calling for a righteous jihad against the atheistic forces oppressing their religious kin in Central Asia. With nearly all the Soviet Union's neighbors now facing them in open conflict, the Japanese smelt blood in the water and began an invasion against the Soviet Union. This then solidified the Kuomintang's alliance with the Soviets in Latin Axis, formally joining the alliance against the Saxon allies. Once Japan had invaded the USSR, the alignment of the Japanese was set. The Japanese were now a member of the Saxon allies. What was once a local conflict between European powers has spilled over into a global conflict which has already involved more nations than our timelines World War II. With the Soviets facing an unprecedented amount of enemies, will they manage to overcome their numerous but ill-equipped enemies of the Middle East? Will the introduction of Turkey into the Saxon Allies be enough to turn the Levantine Front to their favor? Will the Japanese manage to secure Northern Asia while still at war with the Chinese? All these questions will be answered in part 5 of Project Stressa. If you like this kind of video, please give it a like. And if you want more in-depth alternate history videos, please consider subscribing.